Good morning. It's good to, it's good to be with you this morning. Thanks for uh, hanging out with us uh, here at the SEMC. Today is our uh, anniversary Sunday, and uh, we're thankful for God's faithfulness towards us over uh, and to this community for these 72 years. And so thanks for um, joining us here uh, online, as well as those of you who are here in person. Those of you online, if you want to get some donuts and cupcakes ready, that's what we'll be enjoying after the service. Or if you think, oh, donuts and cupcakes, yeah, you could probably time it to join us at the end if you'd like as well. Uh, and so uh, we're, you know, we, uh, we're looking forward to being able to share uh, some um, just, just some good opportunities for reflection this morning, as well as some encouragement and hopefully a challenge as to what, God, what does God desire for us. Uh, as, we, as we start, I just want to share a couple of, uh, of announcements with you. One is that our, uh, in April, our benevolence focus uh, in our local community is with Forest Fritter Friends, and so any funds that are donated uh, to our benevolence um, during the month of April will be given to help further the work that they're doing in training uh, adults um, with awesome abilities, as they say, uh, to, uh, to find further employment. And so they're doing some really good work out in Forest, and uh, we, we, uh, we're thankful for Tom and Janet, and uh, look, look forward to uh, how God's going to yet use them. And then, uh, the, what's the next thing there, Nathan? Just maybe prompt me through. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, first aid training, uh, so that's on Saturday, June the 1st. And we'll be offering it here. And uh, what we're we if you were if you think ah I I could use an update on that or I've never had that uh, we would like to be able to provide just because our facility is used with by so many people all throughout the week and so we would like to have as many people uh, as possible uh, trained in that. So there is about uh, six or seven hours of some online work that needs to be done in advance of June first. Um, but if you are part of the SCMC, then we'll help cover the costs of that uh, for you as well. It is a full day on Saturday, June 1st, I think from 8.30 to 4.30. Uh, and so um, if that's something that's of interest to you, then, uh, then please contact the office so that we can get you connected to that. And then there, there's uh, one more, right? Thank you. Uh, the library. Our library ladies have uh, been in and uh, been at work, and so they have a, a, a brand new selection of new books, as well as a section uh, for Mother's Day. And so, uh, go ahead, and uh, you can visit you can visit them, uh, and uh, and grab some of those resources. And if you do sign a book out, here's a really cool thing: remember to bring it back. I know it's new information. <laughs> We bring them back. I know it's great uh, when that when that happens. Um, you know, one of the things that we uh, we so we have some things that we want to celebrate today, uh, but we also want to take a moment and just uh, as we as we begin, we want to pray for the Kita family. Uh, as some of you know, over the last couple of weeks, we've been praying uh, for them as Joy's uh, father has been in hospice and he passed away uh, early yesterday morning, uh, late Friday night, and uh, and so. Um, we will, we're looking towards having a, uh, a service for them uh, Friday afternoon. Details uh, will be made known, but if you, we we're, are likely going to need some help uh, with that. It'll be uh, done here, and so uh, just um, we'll send some information out, and if you're able to help uh, or block some time off, that would be valuable if you could do that as well. So as we, as we begin this morning, let's, uh, let's pray together and, uh, and let's ask uh, God to, uh, to bring a particular comfort uh, to, uh, to the Kita family. And so God, we, uh, we come before you and we give you thanks uh, today on this beautiful spring day. And we recognize, God, that you indeed are faithful. Uh, we don't take for granted or we try not to. Uh, maybe sometimes we're better at that than, than others but your great love for us uh, and uh, your care over us and your desire, God, to uh, help us understand what it means to follow Jesus with all of our lives. And as we gather today, we, we are thankful for those who have gone before us, uh, who have helped us to understand that and uh, thankful for the way in which you have made an impact in this community over these 72 years. 
And uh, also, Father, as we, we gather, we recognize the gift of a family and the opportunity to celebrate these good things, as well as the privilege of coming alongside one another in times of loss and grief. And, and, uh, and so we pray in particular for the Keita family and the passing of Joy's father. And we, we ask, God, that you would be in particular with them uh, and that you would bring peace and comfort amid the loss. And the decisions that need to be made, God, would you uh, just guide them and help them, help them to help one another uh, through this time and in the days and the weeks and the months that follow. Uh, we're thankful, Father, for uh, the presence of Christ uh, in and among them and the promise of, of uh, eternal rest for those who have faith in you. And we, we celebrate that in Paul's life, who's gone to be with you. And so, God, as we gather this morning, uh, we don't gather just because of the present. We gather because what you have done for us in the past. And we gather for what, because of what you have promised yet for us in the future. All centered on Jesus. So would you take what we bring? God, would you use that for your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. I invite the music team to come up and do this this morning as well. And you may have noticed while they do, uh, some of you may have noticed, hey, there's donuts out there and, uh, and things like that. And the donuts are orange colored. Did you catch that? Did you see some of that? Uh, and so um, somebody said, are, are those for now or for later? I don't care. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, you, you use your discretion uh, on that. Uh, but we'll, we'll look forward to enjoying some of that later. All right. Good morning. Uh, it's so nice to have you here today. Happy anniversary. Um, are you feeling 72 today? Sometimes on a rainy morning, you kind of feel 72. It's all good. Um, I'm going to be reading this morning to call us to worship from John chapter 15, starting in verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Amazing words there. We're going to sing some songs this morning, and because it's an anniversary day, I went back into the vault <coughs> and pulled out what I thought were some oldies. I hope they're oldies and goodies, but uh, if you go back to the 1950s and move forward, that would be 72 years, so... Um, Hopefully you'll recognize all of the songs this morning as ones you've sung before. Um, if you're able, I'll ask you to stand and sing with us this morning, please. the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to Yeah. 
you. Please have a seat. and uh, Jared and Sandra, and we welcome back Linda. And um, Linda has, uh, over the last several months uh, in the fall, she uh, had a concussion. Uh, she got a soccer ball to the head at school where she teaches, and uh, her recovery has been slow and long, but she has persevered, and we're thankful that she's back serving among us. Did you, get, did you catch that? She now, uh, she, what, she, her, she, je vois la vie en rose. She sees the world in pink. Yeah, yeah, welcome back. Yeah. Yeah, welcome back. So, yeah, so great, thank you, and thank you for allowing us to pray with you and for sharing the, the hard parts of that, that journey with us and for staying connected uh, to, to everything. We appreciate you as well. Um, I want to read for you these words um, from uh, 1 John chapter 4. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our friends. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Let's uh, uh, take a moment as just as we send our kids off to kids and let's pray first and then we'll send, send them off, all right? So God, we are thankful to be able to sing these songs that take us through years and stages, eras, maybe some for some of us, um, our own journey, or as we have listened to the lives of others, uh, their journey. Uh, we are impacted because of the way you have demonstrated the love of Jesus Christ to those who have gone before. And so uh, we were thankful for that, Lord. And we're thankful for the opportunity, the privilege, the freedom that you give us to open your word and uh, to share our lives and how your word has impacted us uh, with generations from youngest to oldest. And so now as we, uh, as we dismiss our kids, we pray, God, that the life and the love of Jesus would be made known to them. Thank you for the <coughs> privilege that you give us. Uh, for this time. Bless their, their time together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so if you're here for Kid Jam, uh, age two to grade six, then you can make your way downstairs um, with Mrs. Keita, with Michaela, and uh, the other leaders there with you. Thank you uh, for doing that. That's awesome. Appreciate that. And I just want to take a couple of moments before I bring the... Uh, the music team back up, uh, just to uh, share just a little bit of, uh, of reflection for us. Uh, and I mentioned just uh, being able to reflect back on generations, and uh, maybe some of you don't do that, and uh, frankly, maybe I wouldn't do that necessarily, but having the opportunity to serve as part of this uh, church family and in our denominational family for uh, a number of years now, I've come to appreciate uh, not just the, the role that is a privilege for me to serve among uh, serve in here among among you, um, but all the more humbled at the way in which God has um, been guiding uh, this church family over uh, these seventy two years, and uh, and so in this past year, in this past year, three former pastors have gone to be with the Lord. Um, uh, Ron Byers last summer, uh, Roy Stewart, um, maybe I get that, am I getting that right? Yeah, Roy Stewart just a few weeks ago, and then this past Friday morning, uh, Reverend Lloyd Fretz uh, passed away, and, uh, and so he has served here the most recently, the other two uh, much earlier in our, in our history, at the beginning of our history, and I'll, I'll mention some of that a little later on, um, but uh, Pastor Lloyd Fretz uh, pastored here 
at the end of the 80s, I think into 1990. And he was here under, uh, while he was here is when the, the gym was built uh, at that time as well. And, uh, and so it's, you know, it's he, um, as I began my tenure here, he was a great encouragement to me and he has a great love uh, for uh, the city of Sarnia and uh, the work that uh, would go out from here. And uh, the, the vision with which that uh, gym was built uh, left unfulfilled for many years. And so how uh, excited he was in recent years to recognize how that, is, that piece of our facility is being used to extend the life and the mission uh, of Jesus Christ here in our community. And so I, I also then uh, bring you greetings from uh, Ken Benson, who uh, served alongside uh, uh, Pastor Lloyd Fretz during some of those years. Uh, he texted me this morning and uh, just wanted to convey um, just uh, his, um, his uh, their grief over, uh, over the, the loss of Pastor Lloyd, but his appreciation as well uh, for that and for his, their, he and Carolyn for their love for our church family. Uh, for uh, not only their time where they served here, but our continual support to them as they equip others to serve globally uh, in different places around the world um, as missionaries. And, uh, and so uh, I say all of that to say we, uh, we often we come into our space and we, we think of our own little worlds and, and there's a lot that, that happens within the, the, the parameters of our own world. And we can sometimes forget that God has been at work in different ways, through, in different means, through many people over the course of time. And so as we, um, details on uh, the funeral uh, for uh, Lloyd Fretz, Pastor Lloyd Fretz, have not yet been released. And so once they are, we'll send those out into communication as well. And so uh, it, I think it's fitting for us just to take a couple of minutes and um, let me just uh, pray in uh, thanksgiving for those whom God has sent uh, through to us uh, and have affected us all, all these years, right? We, we walk in that gym and uh, sometimes we can take for granted just the activity of it, but that wasn't always the case. And the vision uh, to the desire to see that take place and how it is making a difference uh, is significant even for us uh, these, these many years later. So let's pray together. So Father, as we... Um, as we uh, just pause for a moment, uh, there are some of us who can hear these names and think back all the way through uh, to those beginnings. And, um, and so uh, there are those of us who, uh, for those names are new and uh, maybe have very little significance to us. And yet, no matter what, uh, you have used uh, those men and their wives, their families, uh, and uh, they are a sampling of many others over the years uh, to continue to uh, bring the truth of God to this community and uh, to direct us according to your mission. And we are thankful that as we look across and we see and we reflect on them, uh, their service uh, didn't uh, begin or end uh, with who we are, but uh, God, they, they served well uh, past what we would consider retirement age and uh, their desire to see the kingdom of God uh, advance uh, is inspirational. And each of them uh, brought, um, were used by you to further your vision for us here. And for that we give thanks. So may we be mindful of those things that you have begun. And we ask, God, that you would complete them in Christ Jesus uh, through us. And may we, likewise, God, be faithful in our seasons to point others uh, to the good things that you have yet to do, that are yet possible. Uh, and so thank you for your love for us. We pray for comfort, especially uh, this week, to the Fretz family, for Marie and uh, as, they, as they gather as a family and um, as, they, as a community will come around them in the kitchen area over the course of these days. Uh, and we give you thanks for how you will yet encourage because of the testimony uh, of these men in particular this week uh, of Lloyd Fretz. And so, God, would you guide us uh, according to your truth uh, for, the rest, uh, for the rest of this time and as we prepare to go into your word? 
prepare us, Father, to, to be equipped to serve you all the more. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And as the, as the music team uh, comes back, let me just uh, read these words, and this is where we'll be this morning from Colossians chapter 1. Uh, just a few verses where we read, starting in verse 15, that the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the, he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth, or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and your enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish or free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel... This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. This is God's word to us here on this Sunday, a 72nd anniversary of the SEMC. Let's sing of the goodness of God together. If you're able, I'll ask you to stand and join us, please.
so much. Please have a seat. Well, if you have your Bibles, you want to keep those open to that passage in Colossians chapter 1, that would be great. Reflecting on the goodness of God for us, uh, often we individualize these things, and, uh, but uh, it's so important to recognize the benefit of reflecting on these things uh, together um, as, a, as a church family. In a culture of division and polarization, we need efforts that forge unity amid the diversity. Those are words spoken by the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, Edith Dumont. She spoke them at the 56th annual prayer breakfast held in Toronto in early March. Her address called for acts of love that lead to peace. Her words were not the only ones on that morning longing for hope amid the societal ills that are increasingly becoming harder to ignore. And so as we gather today, we do so as always in the difference, in celebrating the difference that Jesus makes to our lives through his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension to the heavens, and his promised return. We do do so with those across our city, with those across our country and around the world, women and men, boy, girls and boys, who share, who by shared faith in Jesus Christ are called the church. On a local level today, as we've mentioned several times, we celebrate God's faithfulness to our community through this expression, the church, the expression of his grace and truth towards us here in Sarnia. 72 years. That's a long time. Some of you understand that more than others. Initiated first as a shared desire between the Missionary Church in Port Huron and the, and the United Missionary Church in Petrolia to be positioned strategically to reach the growing community on then the outside edge of Sarnia. We started in a building just up the road, the corner of East and Brighton, then moved down to this location some 20 years later. The buildings serve as symbols in our community. Over our history, we have been mostly faithful to the unique vision that God has for us. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is uh, Proverbs 22, verse 28, speaks of the importance of honoring the ancient boundary stones put in place by our forefathers. Those, thing, those, those boundaries are there for a reason. They help us to honor and respect those around us. They help us to celebrate what God is doing among others. And they help us to understand how we uniquely contribute as one part of his kingdom desires for our city. And as I've done over the last number of years, I I thumbed through some of the archive documents of our our church history. And I, I did so this time knowing, as mentioned earlier this past year, three of our former pastors have passed away since last summer. Ron Byers and Roy Stewart, and then uh, Pastor Lloyd Fretz here just a, a couple of days ago. Now, you know, there's no expectation for, for many of you to retain these names. However, there is an importance in learning through what the Lord has impressed on them and others regarding the advancement of his kingdom purposes as we continue on as the SEMC. So in my archival reading, uh, two things stood out to me regarding those earliest years Uh, One is that first, the denomination didn't address the local church by their name, the city, or their building. Instead, they were addressed as a field. And while it's true that the building on East Street first went up uh, on what was then a field, this this means of address was actually in keeping with the compassionate perspective of Jesus and the recognition that every community represents a harvest field into which workers are to engage. And the second thing that caught my attention was during uh, 1957, there was a stated desire 
uh, of a request by the pastor at the time to obtain a part-time job in addition to his full-time role. His request, however, was denied by the board, and the reason for the denial stands out to me, and it's, it's just a few words. It says, it was decided that he had a full-time job on the field, and there was a large area to be visited. And so as the decades went on, other churches that were once part of this community have moved to other places in the city, but the SEMC, by the grace and the enablement of God, remains to fulfill that, was that which he has established us to do, that is, serve our community. The harvest field of the southwest quarter of Sarnia and the places where we live throughout the city and county according to his truth, his grace, and in reflection of his great love. Today we also uh, come together to continue our learning series, Strengthening Our Faith, and that may be of more relevance to, to some of you. Our focus today, fittingly, is the church. In, in our statement of faith, which can be found on our, our website, we read this simple statement that reflects much of what we've already been learning. It states that the church, locally and universally, is composed of all believers who have been united by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> As with, um, with Jesus Christ as the living head and the sovereign Lord. You know, a couple of things that I appreciate about this, about this statement as first is it reminds us of the unity, the harmony, and the oneness that we are to have with others who profess faith in Jesus Christ. It's true that among the wider body of Christ, there are some distinctions that mark our local context, even our denomination, whole denomination leanings one way or the other. However, none of those things should result in a lack of honor or respect or commitment to the core belief of faith in Jesus Christ in whom we find salvation. Secondly, there is a reminder that the church is not a social club. It's not an organization, or it's not even a building. We are an outworking as people, an outworking of our living Savior, Jesus Christ. I have heard over the years this statement that the church is the hope of the world. I respectfully disagree. If the statement ends right there, I disagree. The hope of the world is Jesus, through whom he has established the church to be his representative in the world. We can often neglect the significance of this nuance. You see, we often rele relegate our, our representation as ambassadors of Christ, uh, of Christ in the world as secondary. And the effort to build up or to protect the institution of the church or our brand of the church as primary. We are often taught that the world is out to get us, and so we must intensify our internal efforts to protect ourselves against the big bad world. We can be told that God isn't working in, or welcome in schools or in neighborhoods or in workplaces or organizations or even in governments. Those are all lies that are used to incite us to finger pointing, name calling, blame shifting, that leads to further division and hatred rather than the hope to which Christ has come. To view others as them and not us, we who are us, and we then make judgments and put labels to develop and we assign to them. In so doing, we harm the empowerment of Jesus who implores us through Peter's confession in, in the book of Matthew when Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus' response is, says, Peter, you're right. He says, and on this rock, that is on the confession of faith in Christ, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. You see, it's in the authority of Christ, we, the church, those who confess and profess faith in Christ, have been granted permi permission to engage freely on this earth for the sake of what will be yet in heaven. Jesus says to Peter and to us, he will build the church. And then he says, at the end of the book of Matthew, after he is resurrected and before he ascends to heaven, 
Then he says, all of, to all of you who have questions, who, are, who have doubt, or even to those of you also who are surrendered and worship and ready, he says, you go into all the world and make disciples of every nation. You baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And then he adds this piece. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You see, we are freed to go by the power and the commission of Jesus Christ, for he, Jesus, is the hope of the world. Jesus says that he will build a church and that we are to go to all the people of the world. In large part, the Western church, we have reversed this. We have said, we will build up the church. God, you send somebody else. We have relegated mission or evangelism or outreach as small portions of what we do, leaving them to experts, line items perhaps in financial pages or particular days of a calendar year. And then we tire ourselves out to try and build up institutions and rally people that actually lack true compassion for the needs of those in the harvest fields. But let's be clear, God's mission has the church. The church doesn't have a mission. The mission came first. The church comes through the mission. The church is the means by which the mission of God is accomplished. And yet here we are. Some of you are likely familiar that we as a nation, Canada, those who profess faith in Christ as evangelicals would represent 6 to 8% of our entire population, according to recent research by the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada. It might be sobering for you to recognize that that percentage really hasn't changed over many, many, many decades. Put it another way, 92 to 94 percent of the people that you meet in your everyday life are part of the harvest fields for whom Christ has compassion. Some of them are harassed and helpless in a world of growing division. Many, many of them are looking for hope. This is not a new problem. And the solution is also not a new solution. See, the Apostle Paul recognized these things when he wrote his letter to the Colossians. His writings remind us that we need to be people, the people of Jesus who respond according to the truth and the life of Jesus. Jesus is the hope of the world. And Paul goes to great measure to help us understand that there is nothing lacking in Jesus Christ. And as a result, he is the only one through whom hope can be found. And as you read through this, this passage in, in uh, 1 Corinthians, and in Colossians, we recognize that Jesus is united in character and essence and purpose with God the Father. He is the image of our Heavenly Father. Jesus is a representative image of God, and therefore we, by faith in Christ, are to live our lives in response to him. So who is this Jesus? Listen again to some of these words that are used to describe him. He is firstborn over all creation. It's a recognition of the preeminence or the first position of Jesus. He is the top dog. This takes us all the way back to the account of the creation of the world, acknowledging not the creation of Jesus, rather Jesus as the creator. He is the one through whom the whole world comes into being. You'll see this phrase repeated over and over again, all things. And you can, you can circle or underline how many times you find that. It's a significant term, and it's mentioned several times in, this short, in these short verses. It leaves no margin for neglect or omission. All created matter has its purpose according to the divine order of Jesus. Those things that we see, and just as importantly, those things that we do not see, do we believe that God can work in ways that, that can, he can only work in ways that we can observe or predict or control? Or can he work beyond that in ways that are unseen to us? If so, in what way does our speech or our prayer or our action allow room for the mystery of God to work? Or do we only want him to work in ways that we can control and define? This is so important. 
Because Paul repeats it to us. He says, in earth, in heaven and on earth. And he says, visible and invisible. And he, then he leaves these, these terms, which by their inclusion carry the same concept. He, he also talks about thrones and powers and rulers and authorities. And his meaning is those things that are seen and those things that are unseen have been all created to serve his purposes. And in case we didn't get it, this purpose then is given extra emphasis. Again, all things, that is everything, everything that we can see and not see, that which we can observe and that which we can't observe in heaven, what we experience through earthly uh, authority and how we're impacted by spiritual principalities, all those things are created by him and for him. Paul then reminds us that he, Jesus, is a sovereign over everything. That, it, that he is the one through whom all things find their definition. He is the one that is holding all things together. Some of our English translations will use the phrase, in him all things consist. And both terms have this sense of wholeness or completeness that is found in Christ. There's a desired balance to all that is around us, most particularly when it comes to the lives of people and how many people are just trying to hold it together. And yet Jesus is the one who promises to hold them together. In addition to all of that, in a, in a wide universal sense, Jesus is the head of the body, the church. It's an analogy that the Apostle Paul would use in his writings to various groups of people. And it's worthy of taking time to consider the significance of these passages, whether it's in Romans 12 or 1 Corinthians 12 or Ephesians 4, and as mentioned here in this passage in Colossians. To understand that with Christ as the head of the body of the church, that we can courageously act in response to his truth. He's thinking it, we move according to it we willingly then submit to his thoughts and desires to do the will of the father we humbly honor the function of the whole and we lovingly work in harmony with one another according to his purposes i won't take time to go into detail on those today but we'll come back to these passages next week as we look about the look on the significance of serving as the church, as the body of Christ. For now, we recognize that in our current world, which is a world subject to despair and disease and division and death, Jesus has a supremacy, not because of his willingness, not only because of his willingness to suffer and die, but also because of the power of God that raises him from the dead. All things all matters, all issues, all perspectives, that is, all people are reconciled through the life, work, grace, and truth found in Jesus Christ. Verses 19 to 20 say, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. His death on the cross, his blood shed for the forgiveness of sin, for the sin of the world, brings wholeness, shalom, peace. All the fullness of God is found in Jesus, who is the, giving, who is the one who gives the impulse to us, because he is the head of the church. In my opinion, the mercy-filled, humble posture that forgiveness ought to inspire is missing from too many who claim to follow Jesus. We are doing damage to one another within the 8% that further alienates us for having integrity among the 92%. Jesus, some of you will remember this, tells this parable about leaving 99% and seeking 1%. We're a long way off. We're a long way off from the example and commission of Jesus. As people reconciled by Jesus, made whole by Jesus, 
The church exists to be ministers of reconciliation. It's a continuation of our faith. It's a means by which we solidify and establish our faith. It is the means by which we bring the good news and allow that the good news to bring stability and inspire the hope of Christ to a world that's desperately in search of hope. About a year ago, about a year ago, I met with a director of a local organization. They, they had contacted us to let us know that they no longer wanted to be connected to us as a, as a church. In short, because we were evangelical. As a result, other organizations were also feeling pressure to side with them. Though by their own admission, none had ever had any reason to question or our, our respect for their work, or for the people in our community, or for our collective efforts in our city. The matter spread larger and wider than what I choose to describe. However, to their credit, this organization, they were willing to meet at our request to, to discuss this further. As a leadership team, our, our governing board, we talked to Jesus about it first, and then we chose to engage. And in that meeting, on, on behalf of the SEMC, I, I went to listen, I went to inquire, and I went to seek understanding. And in, in so doing, and to their credit, we came away recognizing that there was actually common ground in our local efforts according to help serve the needs of those in our community. Oh, it's true, we do so in the name of Jesus, and they don't. That's a key difference. But when I asked about their willingness to shift, in their, in their, to shift their position, it became clear that they were largely influenced by the concept of evangelicals as portrayed in the media. And fortunately, I could not disagree. The sad part is, Largely, evangelicals are known for what they are against rather than for the representation of Jesus Christ in the fullness of truth and grace. And so I apologize for the misrepresentation of many to the example and the commission of Jesus. And while I was thankful for the miraculous means by which the Lord change their perspective back again, and change their policy, I also came away disappointed with the reputation that the church in general has among the 92%. As a governing board, we've been discussing these and other cultural matters, praying through our own biases and emotions seeking clarity and understanding as to our role as those called by Jesus to serve our community. And I want to thank you uh, for your prayer and your encouragement uh, for us. These discussions have led us to listen more intentionally and deeply to the example first of Jesus Christ and how he relates to everybody. We don't just want to do what, institu what institutional church has always done. We desire to be faithful to our unique kingdom contribution to enter into the fields, to learn from, connect with, and serve the 92%. Recently, I read a book entitled The Illusion of Division. It's written by a woman named Monica Harris. In it, she details her experiences and her observations of the social political landscape over the course of her life, and in particular over the last few years. She writes from the perspective of a black woman of relative affluence. She moved from her big city lawyer job in Los Angeles to a predominantly white community in Montana. She moved there with her partner, who is a woman, and their son. Her perspective is so important because her starting place is so completely opposite to mine. Yet she was able to identify with the brokenness of the world we live in and how we are continually being led to division and hatred. She talks about how we're easily taught 
and it, it seems acceptable just to put labels on people. And in her words, she says, to reduce us to human sound bites that ignore that most people are textured and multifaceted beings who may sometimes misspeak and occasionally make mistakes. Her conclusion, speaking from what we or I would consider the 92% perspective is what actually incentivizes me. She speaks of the toll that hatred and anger has taken on our society, saying it also keeps us from doing what we desperately need to do to heal our wounds. It keeps us from forgiving. When we feed our anger, we see forgiveness as a sign of weakness. We don't see that forgiveness isn't a gift to others. It's a gift we give ourselves. It liberates our soul, eases our pain, and allows us to reclaim the joy that every human being deserves. I acknowledge and agree with Ms. Harris's with Ms. Harris to this extent. The world is broken, and we're too easily drawn to pick sides and put labels on people in our community that create further distance and fosters division. I would agree that forgiveness is needed. I would add, and I would hope that you would agree, that true forgiveness comes through the reconciling work of Jesus Christ, who brings peace to the people of, his, of this world through his blood shed on the cross. The hope of the world is Jesus. To be clear, to be really extra clear, Reconciliation is not saying that everybody's okay no matter what they believe. To be clear, again, extra clear, according to the truth that God has commissioned us to gracefully share, is that at the end of days, when Christ returns, all people will be reconciled to the preeminence and the sovereignty of Jesus Christ. Listen carefully to this. Those who in their earthly lifetime profess faith in Jesus Christ will be reconciled <clears throat> to eternal glory with the Father forever in the establishment of the new heavens and the new earth. Those who deny the forgiveness of Christ in their earthly life will also be reconciled to the sovereignty of Jesus. They will see him for who he is, Lord of lords, King of kings. However, according to God's word, they will spend a Christless eternity, tormented by regret, apart from the Father and what the Bible describes as Hades or hell, a place of everlasting punishment. 92% of the people that we meet are looked upon by Christ with compassion because he wants them to be reconciled to him, held by the peace that he offers to experience the wholeness that only he can bring through his forgiveness that comes through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus is the hope of the world. And for those among us who consider ourselves to be of the 8%, then perhaps there's some things that we need to audit. Perhaps there's some things that we need to confess according to the way we, we look upon or treat those around us. What adjustments can you make in the way that you spend your time? With whom can you partner to work together and pray together for the sake of of the 92 percent how can you learn to listen first to the perspectives of others to what extent have you neglected the significance of the salvation of jesus christ in your own life that you have perhaps then become hardened towards others you look at them as them on this day, we, we don't celebrate a building or even a name or a brand. On this day, we celebrate Jesus because he is the head of his body, the church, a collection of people 
united by their shared celebration that he is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus is the hope of the world. And may he yet use us for the sake of all those under heaven in the fields where he leads us. Let's pray together. Father, this true confession that Jesus is the living God, the confession upon which you have decided would build your church, we come together today, many of us, we can look back and say, yes, there is a day, there's a time, there's a season where we know that this is true of our lives and we want it to be true all the more. And yet perhaps, Father, we can all acknowledge as well, we are guilty of ignoring the needs and the cries of the 92% the harvest fields for which you have compassion and are drawn towards. Those are different for all of us in the neighborhoods that we live in, the schools and the workplaces that you've put us in. Forgive us, God, for living with blinders or covering our ears. Forgive us for judging and placing labels upon people that create more distance the hardness that can appear not only in our, in our presentation, but also in our voice as we speak about those who do not share our faith in Christ. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the vision, the mission, the purpose that you have given to us here at what we now know as the SCMC. Father, may we continue to honor your ancient boundary lines. May we continue to celebrate the good things that are being done that further your kingdom purposes. And Father, would you enliven the gifts and the passions of others to serve according to what you have yet to accomplish as we await the day for Jesus to return. Our living Lord, our conquering King, our Savior, in whose name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. We're going to close our service today by singing about some of the many things that we believe, and that we believe in God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you're able, I'll ask you to stand and let's sing this song together.
I love, and there's a lot of things that I love about our, our church family, but one of the things that I love is uh, this leaning, this desire to learn more and more about what it means to reach those around us. And thankful even in conversations this week to recognize God is stirring in the hearts of people. How do I connect with the people around me? And uh, that's exciting. So continue to pray uh, into that. And speaking of exciting things, uh, could you, we want to invite you also to pray for, uh, some of you may know that um, Tim and Karen Allen's daughter Shayla is getting married next Saturday. And uh, so we uh, want to be praying for uh, her and um, her fiance Mitch as they, uh, as they get married next Saturday uh, as well. And so um, with that, uh, did you know that those donuts, why are they orange? So who knows how long we're going to have orange donuts for, so get them while they're, while they're appropriately themed, uh, all right? And take some time to encourage one another. Let me send you out with this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. God be with you. Enjoy some refreshments. Thank those who are serving and uh, have a great week. Go in peace.